Amen. So <clears throat> there in Genesis chapter 2, verse, uh, the well, verse I want to look at is verse 25. Of course, this is talking about uh, when God puts man and the, the woman in the garden. And it says in verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, it says they were not ashamed for a reason. And the reason why is that because God knew that in the future, those that would be reading this, that they would, they would wonder about that, whether or not, you know, what, what, what was their take on being naked in the garden. And he's saying, look, they were not ashamed. And the reason he mentions that is pointing that out is because today, as human beings, being naked is a shameful thing. Right. Uh, being naked is not uh, something that we should want. In fact, it's very innate. It's, it's very, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's part of our nature, part of our makeup. Uh, to, to be ashamed of being naked. But what I want to preach tonight about is the shame of nakedness or the shame of nudity, the shame of nakedness because of the fact that we're living in a culture now where uh, nakedness is very commonplace. Now, it's not going to be what the, world, what the world defines as nakedness and what the Bible defi defines as nakedness are two different things. You say, Brother Corbin, I, I live in the same country you are, uh, you, you're living in. I don't see naked people. Oh, yes, you do. You just don't realize it. You know, they're, they're around. You know, it's just that we have two different definitions of what naked means. Right. So I want to go through tonight, and I want to define what nakedness is biblically, and I want to show us why it's something we should avoid and it's something to be ashamed of. Um, <coughs> first of all, we see that here, if you would, go over to Genesis chapter 3. It says in verse 7, this, is, of course, is after... They have gone to the, uh, uh, Eve has gone and eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were commanded to not eat of. And then she proceeded to go ahead and give to her husband and he also ate. And they fell in sin. We know that story. Verse 7, we'll pick it up. It says, and the eyes of them were open and they knew that they were naked. So what's the first thing they realize after falling into sin is that they're naked. And they sewed, uh, uh, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. I mean, they're so ashamed that the first thing I want to do is cover up. And, you know, that's the nature that we have today. You know, kids get to a certain age where they realize that once they, that what nakedness is and it's a shameful thing, you know, they, they want to, to start covering that up. You know, we've all had, well, I don't know if we've all had, I, I don't think I've ever had it, but I've heard told that there's that, that dream where you go to school and you realize you get there and you're not wearing any clothes and everyone, it's like the great fear, right? And you, you run out screaming. But if, if anyone is to ever, you know, be caught naked in some circumstance, it's a shameful thing. It's not something... Uh, that we want to happen, at least it shouldn't be, and it's something that causes just an innate sense of shame, right? And we see that here. That's one of the first things, and they fall in sin, that they're instantly trying to cover up their nakedness. And it says in verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So it wasn't it enough that they had covered up, now they're hiding from him. They hid from the Lord uh, God amongst the trees of the garden, and the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked. So why is the, well, he gives him the reason of why he was afraid. And the, for, the reason was, was that he was naked. He didn't say, uh, I was afraid because I'd broken your rule, because I'd broken your law, because I'd gone against your will. He's saying, look, I'm afraid because I was naked. That's why he was afraid there. And I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So we see right away that being naked is something that is something to be ashamed of. It is a shameful state to be in. We should not, we should be careful not to be naked because God is very careful to avoid nudity or nakedness. We see that in the scriptures. If you would turn over to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, and we'll see where that God himself is careful to avoid nudity. Now, of course, when I say that, I don't mean him but I'm talking about nudity in his presence or other people being naked in, in, around him in his presence or in his service. <clears throat> being naked is something to be ashamed of. <clears throat> the Bible says, and you're going to Exodus chapter 20, it says in Exodus 32, of course, this is when Moses is coming down the mount for the first time with the tablets of stone and Aaron has caused the people to worship the golden calf. And it says, and Moses saw that the people were naked so instantly in the rebellion, one of the first things they did was they were naked. And for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. So it was a shameful thing for these people to be naked. Being naked is shameful. And that is why God is careful for, uh, to avoid nudity or nakedness in his presence. Look here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. 
And also of earth shalt thou make unto me, and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy, uh, thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thy oxen. So he's telling him, look, you're going to make an altar of earth if you want a, uh, a sacrifice to me or worship me. This is how you're going to do it. He gives very specific instructions. And he says, at all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So God does not, he didn't even not want steps built going up to his altar, lest their nakedness should be discovered. Now, you kind of have to think that situation through. What exactly does he mean? That Does that mean if we go up a set of stairs, all of a sudden we're naked? No. What he means is that if you're going up a set of stairs and someone is going on ahead of you, if they're wearing a robe or a skirt, there's a potential that your nakedness would be discovered to that individual. So God wanted to avoid that. He was so careful about it that he told them about it and warned them about it and said, look, Thou shalt not have any stairs, lest thou nakedness be discovered. That's how careful God is to avoid nudity. So keep that in mind as I preach this tonight, lest you think, you know, Corbin's just being a prude. You know, he's just some old-fashioned fuddy-duddy that doesn't want to have any fun. God didn't even want steps. Lest the, you know, what if somebody just, you know, not even in case somebody were to accidentally look up and get a glimpse, but what if that person were to fall down and everything's flying up in the air? That's how careful God is to avoid nudity. So keep that in mind as we go through this tonight and to understand that you might think I'm being old-fashioned. You might be thinking I'm just some old fuddy But you know, God's got some pretty strict rules. Now go over to Exodus chapter 28. Keep something in Exodus tonight. We're going to come back later. But go back to Exodus 28, particularly in Exodus 28. We'll come back here and look at the same verse again. You say, well, how careful was God to avoid nudity? Well, you know, he, one, he avoids steps, but then those men that were going to be serving at that altar, the pr high priests, he says in verse 42, Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. So they, he even wanted undergarments underneath the, the, the priestly robes just you know, for extra precautions in case that there was any chance that somehow the robe got lifted, whatever, that there would be breeches there. He specifically says the breeches were there to cover their nakedness. That's what he wanted. He wanted that nakedness covered. He did not want it exposed in his presence. So we see that God is very careful to avoid nakedness. And really, another thing we need to understand about nakedness or nudity is that not only is it shameful, not only is it something that God avoids and is very careful to avoid and doesn't want in his presence, but it's also something that it, it often is the result of God's judgment. Okay? Now, I'm not saying every time the three-year-old comes running out of the bathroom you know, in his birthday suit, that God's judging, right? That's just kids growing up, they're silly. But when a society becomes naked, often it's because of God's judgment. It's, it's part of God's judgment. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Someone asked me just recently, you know, uh, why is it that America has become such a naked country? Why is it that people in America are so comfortable with just flaunting their bodies so openly and being naked? How did this happen? And in short, the answer is they became godless. They forgot the God of the Bible and they've for forsaken his commandments. And when that happens, a nation goes down a path of immorality and the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the, the lusts of man are unbridled and they become naked. And, and part of that is often sometimes even the judgment of God. Look here in Deuteronomy 28 verse 45. Of course, this is when Moses is rehearsing the blessings and the cursings to the nation of Israel before they go over into the promised land. And he says in verse 45, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. So he's saying, look, if you forsake the, wor the word of God, this is what's going to happen. And they shall be a sign for thee and for a wonder upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in what? Nakedness and in want of all things. So even being naked, that would be something that an enemy would cause to come upon you. When God would judge a country and they would be uh, overtaken by a, a foreign enemy, you know, they would, they would end up naked often. You know, the, the, en the enemy would be so calloused and careless about their captives that they wouldn't even care about whether or not they had proper clothing. So nakedness often, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's necessarily because we're being overtaken by, you know, a foreign invader, 
But a lot of the nakedness that we see in our country today is the result of people forsaking the commandments of God, forsaking the law of God. It's the same, uh, it is the same result. So we see also that, uh, you know, a, a culture that becomes naked, a society that becomes na naked, it's indicative of a godless, immoral society. And is that not what we're living in? And we're living in the midst of a perverse and wicked generation, an adulterous generation. It shouldn't shock us that they're naked out there. And they wouldn't say that they're naked, but they are. And we're going to look at that. We're going to see how they are, in fact, naked. If you would, turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. We'll look at verse 1. 2 Chronicles 28, verse 1. And Ahaz, it says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. So this is one of the kings of uh, uh, Judah coming up. And when uh, he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which is right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made molten I images for Balaam, for, uh, and, and moreover the burnt incense in the, uh, in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So this is a wicked man. He's forsaken the Lord God, and he's even making child sacrifice in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He's, he's sacrificing children in literal fire. A wicked individual. Look at verse 16. At that time did King Ahaz send to the king of Assyria to help him, for again the Edomites had come and smitten Judah, just like God said would happen, that if you forsook him, the enemy would come upon them, right? And had smitten him and carried away captives. The Philistines also invaded the cities of the low country of the south and the Judah and of the, uh, Beth Shemesh and Agilon and, and Gedaroth and Shoko and the villages thereof and Timnath and the villages thereof and Gizmo and the villages thereof and dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of the king Ahaz of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed the sore, the, the, the sore against the Lord. One of the sins was not only the fact that this guy was, you know, sacrificing children, but also that he was making them naked. He was, he, God made them low, for he made Judah naked. He was, you know, they were getting involved in all these heathen practices. And, you know, you don't have to look very far into ancient, you know, uh, heathen cultures to see just an abundance of nakedness. I mean, we see many examples of that in the statues and the depictions of nudity in ancient civilizations like Rome and Greece and Egypt. Right. It's all over. You know, they're, they're, you know th th those, the, the, the naked statues, the, you know, the David statue, right. that's, that's nudity. It's nakedness. Right. It's, it's, it's not right. And that's what we see going on with Ahaz here. Ahaz is a man who forsakes the Lord God. He starts to go after other gods, heathen gods. And part of that is not only the wicked abominations of sacrificing your own, own children, but it's also the fact that you start making people so immoral that they just become okay with nakedness. That natural uh, instinct to cover up you know, gets, uh, gets uh, desensitized and they, people become comfortable with just taking off the clothes, walking around naked. Now, Today, we see the same thing going on. You say, no, we don't. Yes, we do. We see the same thing taking place even today. There are common examples of societies just becoming naked. Think about the nudist colony. Think about the nudist camps. I mean, there's whole campgrounds that are dedicated to this in this country, where it's just where you can go camping, and you can roast a marshmallow, and go for a hike, and you can do it all naked in the presence of a bunch of other naked people. And I'm not just talking about, you know, like well, what uh, the Bible defines as naked, but I'm saying full-blown naked. And people pursue that, and they think that's a good time. There's nude protests in this country. People that part of their protest, they're just going to get naked. What about the nude bike races? They're going to, for a charity, we're going to ride through the town naked. <laughs> really? Nude bike races? Think about the spring break parties that go on every spring. All the college campuses, all the nudity that just goes on there. We are, this is a naked country that we're living in, that people are becoming so desensitized and so immoral that they just think there's nothing to being naked anymore. They're, they're perfectly fine with it. You know, and it's worth noting that often when, in, in, when nakedness is often associated with, you see drugs and alcohol being accompanied with nakedness. You would see that in scripture. I don't want to dwell on that point, but the Bible uh, says in uh, Lamentations, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz, the cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. You know, that's what you see at a lot of the spring rake parties and things like that, right? The drunkenness and then what follows next? The nakedness. They go hand in hand. So 
these, this is, there's common examples of nakedness. There's ancient examples of nakedness. There's biblical examples of nakedness. And in every instance we see it's a shameful thing. And it's, it's, it's telling us that we're in an immoral uh, country and we see that God is one that considers nakedness a shameful thing and it's something that he does not want in his presence. And you say, oh, well, the nakedness in his presence, that's just for those that are serving him. Those are just, you know, that people who are religious, they should be naked. Yeah, but the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. That God sees everything. That everything is open and naked unto him to whom we have to do. That God sees all of us at all times. You know, it, it, we can't just, you know, think that God doesn't see us uh, outside of the church walls. <clears throat> so, there are, of course, today that even the world would say there are explicit forms of nudity. Now, we have to define some terms. What is, not necessarily terms, but some standards. We have to define the standards of what the world calls naked and what the Bible calls naked. Because that's what a lot of even Christians today do. They think, well, we're not naked, but they are naked. Because their standard is not the biblical standard. Their standard they've let their standards be formed by what the world considers naked. And the world has a very loose interpretation of what naked means. I mean, they've, they've moved the boundary pretty far before they'll say somebody's naked. <coughs> so one, one uh, example to, to, uh, to look at, you know, what the world would define as naked, and let, without getting too crass, without being too blunt, or just, you know, using great plainness of speech here, you know, what does the world consider naked? Let me just say, it, let me put it this way. The world what the world considers naked is exposed potty parts, right. okay? If it's, if it's not the parts that you use to relieve yourself, then it's not naked. Anything goes besides that. That's the world standard today. That's the truth. That's why you'll see them walking around in the, the G-string, the string bikini, the Speedo. You know, the, now, that's the world's definition of nakedness. That's not ours as Christians. This is where we get our standard for what is naked and what is not. <coughs> I'm going to read to you from the uh, Motion Picture Association of America, okay, their rating system. And part, when they look at a film and how they rate that film G, PG, PG 13, R, or X, part of it, you know, it's not just the violence and the drug use and the foul language, it's also the, the level of nudity and what the nudity is being used to depict. They take that into consideration, okay? So let's look at the world in the Motion Picture Association, and let's let them define for us what they consider naked. So when you look at a PG film, nudity is restricted to PG and above. This is from their website. Nudity is restricted to PG and above, and anything that cons constitutes more than brief nudity will require at least a PG-13 rating. So anything that has more than brief nudity gets a PG-13 rating. Are you listening? You know what that means? Anything that has less than brief nudity in it is PG. Right. Meaning if you sit them down to a PG film, your children to a PG film, there's a chance they're going to see nudity. Yeah, but it's only going to be less than brief. Maybe it's a flash. Maybe it's just a glimpse. Is that what you want your children to see? How much nudity is acceptable? How many strangers do you want your children seeing naked? And for how long? And how much? <coughs> you know, that, I don't want them to see any of it. That's why I'm not going to sit them down in front of that trash and that filth and just let the Motion Picture Association tell me what's acceptable for my children. Right. You know, we as parents need to take that into control for ourselves. Amen. Because kids are curious and kids are impressionable. And when they start seeing things like that, I mean, it, it makes a long-lasting impression and can get some wheels turning that just don't need to be turning. Right. <clears throat> So it said, no, now so the world thinks it's fine for your kids to see naked people as long as it isn't depicting copulation, okay? And if you don't know what that word means, you don't need to know, okay? Don't worry about it. They, they think it's fine for your kids to go see that taking place. As, as long as that's not taking place, that nudity is acceptable. Now, it also says nudity that is physical, and I replaced that word physical for another word they used, it will generally require an R rating. So anything less than people copulating is fine for your children to see. That kind of nakedness, the world says, that's okay. You know, we, we suggest parental guidance. You know, like the parent's gonna know when to cover the eyes. You know, 
Like the parents going to notice it to turn to fast forward or turn the part off. Like they've seen the movie before. And quite frankly, the parent probably shouldn't be watching it either. I mean, what makes it right? You get to a certain age, it's like now I can look at naked people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not so. That's not how it works. <clears throat> And the world says, you know, PG-13, you know, they can look at more. It's okay that they can have more than brief nudity. Think about the insanity of that, of saying it's okay for some hormone-laden teenager to see more than brief nudity. That's crazy. Yep. You got some teenage kid in there with like a liter of testosterone in his bloodstream <laughs> that's going to see some, some nudity. Right. That's, that's, you're playing with fire. Right. That can lead down paths you don't want to go down. <coughs> You know, and that's the hypocrisy of the world. They just had this real loose definition of what's acceptable. They had this very broad, uh, very open-ended, just, you know, anything goes standard on nudity. And, and like, as if there's no consequences of seeing this stuff. As if it's not that big a deal. As if, as if it's not that influential on a person's mind. To see nakedness and, 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 and uh, provocative images at any age, especially at a young age. They think there's nothing really going on there. There's, it's really doesn't have any effect. Okay, well then explain all the nudity and the, the, the uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to use a word other than the word we probably know. Uh, all the uh, physical allure, all the flesh and the skin that's being used in advertising. I mean, if it's not that big of a deal, if it's not that powerful of an uh, imagery, nudity if it's not that much of a motivating force and influential on people's minds why is it all over advertising right. why is it that every beer billboard or, or commercial has just bikini babes and six-pack abs and just lots of flesh and skin everywhere because they know that's what sells that's what's going to get people to buy their product and that's been known for a long time you know they started using that a long time ago i mean you could you could find the old you know uh the old tobacco cans, you know, they were selling tobacco with the woman with the loosely draped, you know, whatever on her, you know, not much is left to the imagination. That's been going on for a long time. And it's far more explicit today. I mean, it just, and it, what it gets into, and really, and this is why we live in a society that has just turned women into objects. Right. And don't value them for what they really are. And just turn them into these just things almost. I mean, I remember the last times I actually intentionally sat down to watch television years ago. I sat down, it was like a football, you know, some football game was on. I was over at a family friend's, I was like, you know what, what's the harm, I'll just watch a football game. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'll never forget the time that this Heineken commercial comes on. And it's this Heineken commercial of this robotic woman with like the perfect shape, but she's a robot, right? And the mini skirt and everything, but it's like all robotic and she comes out and her abdomen opens up and she pulls out an ice cold Heineken and hands, hands it to some guy. I'm like, if that, I looked at my, my uh, brother-in-law at the time and said, if that's not the objectification of women, I don't know what it is. <laughs> like women are just turned into just these beer serving babes of, of robotic babes. That's what the world, and, and the people, oh, it's just a commercial. Man, that stuff is training you right. subconsciously to think like that. D tell, don't, you can't tell me it is. I mean, look at the way uh, women are just being treated in this society. They're just objects. They're just objects of possession. <coughs> and, that's, and that's what we see taking place. And that's really hypocritical of the world, isn't it? To say it's not that influential, it's not that big of a deal, nudity is not that big of a thing, but they know how powerful it is. That's why they use it to influence our minds and to buy their products. <coughs> and here's the thing. As Christians, we can't base what we believe or our standards on the shifting sands of culture. Because there was a time in America where nudity was frowned upon. Where if you went to the beach and you showed an ankle, you know, you were the town hussy. You know, you know but go, go to some water hole now. Right. Every other high schoolers out there, you know, were in their underwear, right. quite frankly. Yeah. And, you know, they'll call it a swimsuit, but if it's got the same stitching and pattern as right. underwear, it's underwear, friend. Right. You know, but it's okay to wear underwear if there's a body of water involved. You know, you would never answer the door. I remember we lived in Michigan and we, you know, in Michigan, lots of lakes, we lived in the Grand Traverse Bay. And the main road went right by East and West Bay. Big, beautiful bodies of water, big sands, volleyball courts, and a whole lot of nakedness going on. And I remember I'd be driving and in and, and our shop, we had to drive by the guys in the work truck, we'd have to drive by that place like 
every other day. Jobs would take us by there. You know, and I had just gotten saved, and I knew I shouldn't be, should be looking at that. And I wouldn't look, and all the guys would be like, man, what's wrong with you? Look over there. Look at all those babes over there. And they, I mean, they practically get in accidents. We're, we're doing 45, and it's like in a busy street, and it's like, man, just focus on the road, please. You know, and they're, they're about pulling, you know, getting whiplash, whipping their necks over there trying to look. And I remember one guy, like, trying to make a point about it, like, oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, it's okay to look. Married guy. I said, oh, yeah? I said, that's underwear. Would you let your wife answer the door in her underwear? Well, of course not. I said, but it's okay for her to go down there and wear it? Right. And he didn't say anything. I could tell I got him thinking. But people never really think about that, do they? You wouldn't let your wife answer the door in the things that she'll wear down to the beach. Right. But as soon as there's sand and water involved, right. all bets are off. That doesn't make any sense, friend. And there was a time in this country where that kind of thing didn't take place. Where if you went to the beach, you jumped in and you were, you were dressed head to toe in clothing. <coughs> so we don't want to base our beliefs on society's standards. Because society's standards are always moving farther and farther and farther away from God. And becoming more heathen and wicked and, and abominable. You know, our standards is the Bible. That, and it's solid. It doesn't move. It's, 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 it's uh, eternal. So let's look at the Bible. Go over to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Because according to the Bible today, not according to the, you know, not according to the Motion Picture Association, you know, but according to the Bible today, many people are naked and don't even know it. They walk around naked all the time. Some of God's own people who are professing Christians walk around naked and don't even know it. And that's, you know, we'll see here a group of people that do just that. Of course, it's addressed on the Laodicean church there in verse 14. And under the angel of the church of Laodiceans, right? These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I work... I would, were that thou wert cold or hot, so then that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And he's saying, look, you don't even know you're naked. That's the, how, what kind of spiritual, you're so spiritually destitute that you don't even know you're naked. Now, whether or not you want to say that's a, a physical nakedness or this is a, a euphemism, talk about their spiritual state you know you could say that and that's probably correct but it, it gives us a good idea that there are still some people out there that is do we not see that today right. that people are walking around and they think i'm i'm fine i'm here you know in my underwear oh i'm sorry bathing suit and I, i'm not naked right. but the bible says you are naked and we're going to look at that because the bible the the bible very explicitly tells us what is considered nakedness Go over to Exodus 28. Exodus 28. I know I got us turning to quite a few pages tonight, but we got we to gotta take a look. We want to get this down. Amen. We want the Bible to be our authority and not just what I say and not just what the Motion Picture Association says. We want to know for ourselves what the Bible says. <coughs> the Bible says in Exodus 28, verse 42, we read this earlier, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. God wanted his, the men of God that would serve him to be covered up even underneath those robes. From the loins, even unto the thighs, shall they reach. So he's saying, look, you're going to cover their nakedness. And then he spells out exactly what nakedness is. He says, from the loins unto the thighs. It's from your lap area to your knee. You know, if you're wondering what your loins are. That's what he's saying. This is nakedness from here to here, from your, from your hip down to your knee, the top of your knee. The Bible says that. Let's look at it again. Thou shalt make them linen breeches to do what? To cover their nakedness. From the loins unto the thighs they shall reach. That's, so that's the nakedness that needs to get covered up. If God left out something, you know, then their nakedness isn't covered. Right? I mean, that, that's very clear in the Bible. There's no question about what God considers nakedness. You need another passage? Let's go over to Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47, and let's look at what God defines as nakedness. Look at Isaiah 47, verse 1. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of Isaiah 47. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. 
uncover thy locks, make bare the leg. He's saying expose the leg, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, thy shame shall be seen. So when he says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, thy shame shall be seen, what is he referring to? The previous verse. Make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. That's the nakedness that's being exposed there. That's the shame that's being seen. So again, we have two passages in the Bible that make it very clear that when a person is exposed from their hip unto the top of their knee, this area of their body, that, that, that is nakedness. That's what the Bible defines as naked. And nothing else, by the way. That's the only thing it defines as nakedness. Now you say, well, God seems like he kind of takes a loose interpretation of nakedness. I mean, what about the top? You know, what about everything from the waist up? Well, the God does not call that nakedness, but God also has a principle in Scripture called modesty. And that's what we want to practice as well. So don't think that just because the Bible defines this as nakedness that all, all of a sudden anything else goes. There is still biblical, there's biblical nakedness, and then there's the, the you know, what uh, is called modesty, where we have to be modest. It does not permit in modesty, okay? So that would, ref now what am I referring to? Okay, so think of this, like the tank top, the tube top, the midriff, right? The low cut blouse, right? That's not exposing your nakedness, is it? Biblically, it's not. You can't tell me that's exposing nakedness because the Bible doesn't find that area. Those areas of the flesh that are exposed when you wear a garment like that, the Bible does not define that as nakedness. Right. Show me a verse where it does. Okay? Now, I'm not excusing those <laughs> garments. I'm not saying those are permissible. You know, you shouldn't wear those. They're not nakedness, but what they are is immodest. And what, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Think about the purpose of those garments. Is it to keep warm? <laughs> Probably not. What are the purpose of those garments? To draw eyes. To get attention. To say, look at me. To show what mama gave me. Right? That's what the point of that is. To draw un, un, t attention, quite frankly, you shouldn't want. And quite frankly, let me just say, you're going to get the attention of the wrong kind of guy if you wear that kind of thing. Right. The guy has only got one thing on his mind. Right. And it's not, it's not love and maybe marriage and a baby carriage. Okay? It's everything but that. <clears throat> the purpose of those garments are immodest because they draw attention to oneself. So just because we understand that those aren't nakedness, that does not excuse those, those type of garments because they are still contrary to what the Bible defines as modest. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, and like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. From head to toe, God wants us to be in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearl or costly array, but that which become, uh, becometh women professing godliness. The principle here that God is trying to get across is that God does not want us wearing clothing, men or women, that is going to draw over a, more attention to ourselves than it should. Amen. I'm not saying you have to go and dress in grandma's drapes, right? It's still you can still look nice and fashionable and classy without being immodest. And there's ladies in here that do it. My wife, I think, is a shining example of that. Amen. And I'm not just trying to earn brownie points right now. <laughs> I really believe that. But you know what? She's also very careful about that. She puts a lot of effort into that. I mean, there's, there's bobby pins involved over there. I'm telling you. You know? She asks me, how does this look? She, she, she does tests. She does this. And says, is anything showing? Right? Because she doesn't want to draw attention to herself in that way. She doesn't want people to see. That's not nakedness to, for people to get a glimpse of that, but it's not modest. It's not shamefacedness. And so if you're going to put on a garment that explicitly exposes that part of your body with the, it, with the, with the, the intent of drawing attention, of a, a drawing another man's eye to look at you in that way, that is not modesty. And that's the principle that's being taught here in 1 Timothy 2, that we should not wear things that are immodest, that would draw attention to us. <clears throat> now, none of those, um, those, those garments that I mentioned earlier, the tank top, the tube top, the midriff, the low-cut blouse, those aren't exposing your na nakedness, but they're not in compliance with modesty, are they? They're not. And while I'm on the subject, neither is anything that is skin-tight, period. Anything that is form-fitting, specifically yoga pants. There I said it. Right. <laughs> 
these skin tight athletic pants that women just, I, I, when I first saw these things coming out in the early 2000s, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, do they realize that those are form fitting skin tight? That they're leaving very little of the imagination of anyone that wants to, to, to wonder about what's under there? And now it's just, it's just blown up. You see it all the time. They just walk around in these things. And let me say it, they look trashy. I'm sorry. I don't care how comfortable or whatever they are. You look trashy in those things. You know, you, they, they, they come out, they're wearing those things, and they're all, I don't know, came out of the gym and they're all sweaty and the hair is up. It's like, ew. You know, it's <laughs> like gross. Like, you don't look good. Like, why would you go on that? And what, I, what blows me, what makes, you know, it's frustrating, but what really makes me mad is when there's a guy with them. You know, if it's a husband or something. And they're letting your wife walk out like that? Knowing how a man's mind works? Right. And this is what some women don't get. They don't understand why they can't wear these type of things. Because they're just trying to look pretty. They just want to look nice. They want to fit in. But here's the thing. You don't understand how a man's, a, a man's mind works. Right. It's innate. It's built in. It's just the way they're wired. You know, it's visual. It's how they, they are drawn to things, visually. So when you're wearing skin-tight things, you're going to draw the attention of the wrong kind of guy. And for a man to be married to a woman who understands how a, ma a man's mind works to let his wife walk out wearing something like that, <coughs> it's weird. It's weird, man. What, you're one of these guys that likes, do, I mean, does it, does it do something for you to know that there's some other guy out there lusting after your wife like that? Like it's a trophy wife or something? I, it's weird, okay? Yep. Right. And when you're with her and she's walking around like that, it's weird. It's, it's, it's just, I, I don't, it's, it's very strange. So the thing is, the point is, is that these skin tight, these form fitting things, yeah, they're covering everything up, aren't they? They're covering from the loins to the thigh, but are they modest? Mm. Can you say that's a modest garment that that woman's wearing? <coughs> you know, I, it just happened, I'm up on the rest strip, you know? You're wondering where this sermon got inspired from. It was the res trip, okay? <laughs> Sitting down there, six in the morning, go down to get my breakfast, right? I figured the only people that are going to be up are old guys, <laughs> right? And I was right, a bunch of old dudes, right? And we're sitting out, and now that doesn't make me one of them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I go down there, we're eating, and about 15 minutes later, here she comes, little miss yoga pants or whatever, with her man with her, and I'm just like, great. Well, I'm glad breakfast is over. I'm glad I finished. But I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out and just watch how many of these guys. Because I figured maybe guys kind of get to an age or that thing, they don't even notice. I'm telling you, every old dude in there was like, right. he noticed. I was like, man, that battle never ends. That's a lifelong battle we have to fight. <laughs> so don't think that just because, you know, you're going to, well, you're, you're just sending it over to grandpa's, you know, she can wear whatever she wants. And they're like, no, they need to not be wearing this stuff at any time. Men's minds are just, they, that's just the way they work. And shame on a woman that would, that would, you know, take advantage of that or think it's not that big of a deal. I mean, Jesus said if a man were to look on a woman to, to lust after her in his heart, he hath committed adultery with already in his heart. That's, you know, and we fight that. And we don't want that for ourselves. But I'm telling you, this society ain't making it very easy. Driving down the 10 down here, every other billboard, fascinations. Be bold, be you. You know, cleavage hanging out. It's like, great, good grief, man, I'm trying to drive here. We don't want to see that stuff. Right. You know, uh, and we're trying to live godly in Christ Jesus. I mean, men have to walk around today just like this. Yep. Because the way women are dressing themselves, and the way their husbands are letting them dress, the way the dads are letting them dress, it's wicked. Right. You know, we go over to our recreation later that day, on Saturday, go over to the Clear Creek Reservoir to jump in. Whole group of teenagers there from the local high school, just in their underwear. Just, just prostier anatomy hanging out everywhere. Like, we, well, ready to go? I mean, I felt convicted for not just immediately throwing the van in reverse and leaving. For actually getting out of the van with God's people and surrounding ourselves with that. And trying to just sit there on the bank of the river and have a conversation and, and enjoy fellowship when all around us are just backsides. You know, we can't enjoy ourselves. We had to leave. But, you know, so we have to understand what nakedness is, what it isn't. And we also have to understand what modesty, what modesty is. Because just because you're covering something up with something that's, that is skin tight, that does not mean you're not immodest. 
You might not be naked, but you're still immodest. Here's a good rule of thumb. If it stretches, it impresses. Okay? That's the that's that's the kind of the rule of thumb right there. If you have to wonder about it, well, if it if it's stretching, it's impressing. <coughs> you know, and we could talk about pants, but that would be like opening up a can of worms too. Because then you have to like go on and on about how women are not to wear pants. Because that would be considered cross-dressing. And I know I can't just throw that out there, so Deuteronomy 22, let's all turn there. Because I'm not so ignorant to think that there may even still be godly women that come to church and when they're not at church, still wearing pants. Now, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know. But it wouldn't be the first time that I've, I've seen that. And you know what? I'm not going to go around policing people. And I love in the past when I've run into women I've gone to church with in like the grocery store and they're in pants. They think I'm going to run and tell the pastor or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna, I don't care what you do. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. This is what the Bible says. Right. And this is just like I preached this morning. You have the liberty to abide by this or not. Now I'll say this. If you come in here in, in a sh mini skirt and a tank top, I mean, we might draw the line somewhere <laughs> with that, you know? Right. I don't know where that is. Oh, we probably will never have to deal with that. I hope not. But let's look at Pro uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Probably most of us know this verse. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. And here's, a, here's one that needs to be emphasized today. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Right. Good night. You could preach a whole sermon on that right there. Right. You know, U of A, you know, promoting your transgenderism, promoting your filth, your cross-dressing men, your trannies. I'm not going to call them transgender. They're, they're, when I grew up, they're called transvestites. Right. You know, like parasite. <laughs> <laughs> it's got that. It's got a little bit of a. When you put the "ite" yeah. on it, it's not as nice, right? right. Transvestite. Right. No, transgender. Right. Sounds nicer. It's softer. It rolls off the tongue easier. It's less offensive to the ear. Transvestite. Amen. Let's bring it back. Amen. Tranny. You know. Right. <clears throat> but the focus. We, let's not go off on that. Okay. <laughs> as tempting as that is, as much as that sermon needs to be preached in 2019 America, that men shouldn't dress up as women is that the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's, there is a garment out there that belongs to a man. It's considered a man's garment. And we have to ask ourselves, what is that garment? I mean, let's read it again. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. So there is some article of clothing that belongs to exclusively to men. Right. Let's go down the list. Hats? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, socks. Maybe let's start at the bottom. No. Socks? Definitely not socks. Right? Hmm. Shirts? No, no, it couldn't be shirts. Sweaters? No. Maybe it's a specific time or type of shirt. You know? No, it's not that. It's pants, friend. Right. It's pants. I mean, look, God told his men, the men of God, the priests, that they were to wear linen breeches. Those are pants. Right. And people want to act like, well, pants didn't weren't around back then. Like it would like, like somehow there was just like this, there was like some kind of scientific revolution where somebody was in a lab somewhere, you know, and spilled some chemicals and there was a big puff of smoke and all of a sudden there was this article of clothing that had two, you know, two hosen sewn together at the top. And they're like, amazing. How do we even come up with this? Like, I'm glad it just appeared because we never could have fathomed of making this at any time in human history. Like, mankind had to reach some pinnacle of technological advancement, you know, before they could come up with the concept of pants. It's ridiculous. Right. Well, we don't see any pictures of Jesus in pants. That's because it's drawn by people who live in a culture that didn't wear pants. Right. Or they were all wearing robes, like a bunch of freaks. You know, or kilts. You know, I was just reading this, on this post on Facebook. People almost like, oh, you bring up pants. Well, men wear kilts in Scotland. Well, they're weird. Yeah. And right. then you stop. Right. Did you see Braveheart? Did you know that that was, a, that was an inaccurate depiction? And I just saw this today. This is perfect timing. That's an inaccurate depiction of William Wallace. It's historical fact that William Wallace and Lowlanders of that class did not even wear kilts. And that kilts did not even come into existence until the 17th century. So if you don't get anything else, you got that. <laughs> right? But it's pants. Okay? And I, I, that's, I almost was tempted to not even bring this up because whenever you bring this up you have to spend 
20 to 30 minutes talking about how pants are a man's garment and prove that. And say, well, there's, women, there's designer women's pants. It's like, they're still pants though, okay? Right. They still do the same thing. Right. And, and here's the problem with pants. I say, well, what's the big deal? Well, women's pants are not designed to be you know, utilitarian. They are designed to be provocative. They are. You know, I remember when my wife was first getting on board with all this, you know, and she started going to church and there was a women's class where the pastor's wife wanted to make a point and she held up a picture of a woman dressed modestly, nicely, in, in a skirt, in a blouse, very nice attire. She, they looked at that and she said, okay. And then she showed him a picture of a woman, you know, nothing raunchy or anything like that, but just in a pair of jeans. And she said, where do everyone's eyes go? And they said when, when, they, when they saw the jeans, that their eyes did not go to her face. Right. When, they saw, when they saw everything else, uh, they saw the, the dress and the skirt and everything, the eyes are brought to the face. But when it's the pants, every, the eyes go down. And they start to look there. Right? And men, you know, any man that's honest will admit that. Right. You see her walking down the street in pants, you know, this happens. Right. Look around next time you're around this kind of thing. Don't look at her. Look at all the other guys' heads that are turning. Right. That's what I do. So, well, it is true. And, and you know, and, 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 and a pair of jeans, a pair of pants had the same effect. You say, well, it's just because all men are dogs. You know, it's because they're wired that way. Right. And pants are designed to be provocative. They're form-fitting. And now we even got dudes wearing <laughs> pants that are form-fitting. I mean, it's, just, it's gone crazy. You say, well, I don't, I don't agree. Well, you know what? That's fine. But here, wh why don't we just do this? Especially in this day and age that we're living in. Why don't we all try to dress as, as you know, just overemphasize our gender by our dress. That's what we should be trying to do. Right. Women should try to be looking as feminine as they can, and men should be trying to look as masculine as they can. And for men, that means not putting on these skinny jeans right. and these polka dot shirts and everything else they got them wearing. Right. You know, go, you know, buy the Dickies, buy the Carhartts, get the cargo pants, right. something, you know, Wrangler, you know, get something that's going to be, you get the relaxed fit. Doesn't that sound nicer anyway? I don't see how that's even comfortable at all to put on a pair of skinny jeans. I've never even tried it, but it just looks uncomfortable right. to try and pull those things up. I mean, they're not even designed to make it to your hips anymore. They're designed to show your, your butt. Right. Excuse my, my, my language. You know, your posterior anatomy. <laughs> that, it's, it's, it's weird. It's a weird culture we're living in. But here's, here's the bottom line, is that when you're, you have to understand something about the way you dress. You know, not only the, the principles of modesty and nakedness, we should understand that, we should abide by that, but at the end of the day, what's on the inside is reflected on the outside. And what you, the way you dress says a lot about what kind of person you are on the inside. I mean, go over to Proverbs chapter 7, and we'll, we'll wrap this up here. My rant's almost over. But this subject needs to be preached on because of the society we're living in. And it's just things that we have to be reminded of because we can become desensitized to this, even as God's people, even as people who practice these principles and do dress right and do wear the right thing and, 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 and take the time to make sure that we're not being immodest or, or, or you know, wearing these things that would draw attention that we don't want. We can still become desensitized to it and when we see it in others, just think, oh, you know, that's okay. Then we end up hanging out too long at the beach. You know, we're, we got the cute and covered on, right? We got the outfit that, that's covered everything up and looks nice. But now we're going to go down to the beach and hang around all that nudity because we're just kind of used to it. We're not naked, but we're going to be around it. That's a real danger. And we should be careful to guard ourselves and, and try to keep that. A, and it's hard to do. At the best we can do is just keep it to a minimum in our, in our lives because it affects our hearts. You know, And it, what's inside a person's heart comes out and it's reflected in their dress. Look at Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6. For I looked at the window of my house, I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. That's a real nice way of saying he was a dummy. Right? Passing through the street near the, her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a man, or excuse me, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. Now people read this passage and say, well, this woman's a whore. She's not. In fact, she says she's, a, she's an adulterous woman and she's trying to get him to come back and commit adultery. She says, you know, the good man has gone away on a long journey and has taken the bag with him and he will not be back. 
you know, come, let us have our fill of loves. But what does it say about her? What is she, how is she dressed with the attire of a harlot? It doesn't say she's a harlot. She just looks like one. Yeah. And that's what we see a lot of today. You know, whether they realize it or not, a lot of ladies are walking out there and they look like harlots. And you say, well, what does a harlot look like? Well, I, I, I you know, uh, when, the, when, they, when they've got leather boots that come up to here, right? And then this is all exposed and the mini skirt starts here. Right. That's what a whore wears. That's literally what the whore, uh, uh, Julia Robert, the character she played in Pretty Woman, wore. That specific outfit. And everything else up here was form-fitting. It's the attire of a harlot. And women put that on. The last time I saw that kind of outfit it was on a newscaster when they came to the protests at Faithful Word. She came to, to, the, to the, the lady on the ground, right? The, the whore boots on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the high boots on the ground, you know, <laughs> was there in the, in the flesh. You know, exposing the flesh. And I remember standing there and um, one of the ladies walked out and she took one look at her and she's like, is she doing a newscast or turning a trick? Oh. <laughs> I was like, burn. <laughs> right? I was like, well, the corner's right there. I mean, 48th and Southern's pretty busy. She could probably, you know, make a few bucks. She's dressed right for it. And I'm not just trying to pick on her. I mean, she's unsaved and everything else like that. But you know what? She knew what she was putting on right. when she got up that morning. They know what that kind of stuff looks like. Right. And that's the world. They think, oh, that looks nice. The attire of an harlot. So it just goes to prove this passage right here that you can dress like a whore without actually being one. That's possible. To, to dress up and look like one without e actually being one. <clears throat> so the point of the sermon is that we should avoid being naked. We need to understand what nakedness is. It's not what the world tells us it is and isn't. It's what the Bible says. Now that we understand that, we should practice covering up our nakedness, being modest, and, and, and as much as we can, avoid seeing the nakedness that we're surrounded by. Just on a daily basis, just being barraged with it, just nakedness everywhere. In the advertising, just in, in every area. And the immodesty. So here, here's, here's a challenge. Now I'm going to challenge the men first. And the more I thought about this challenge, I wonder if I should do it because it could get dangerous. All right? But men love danger, right? Anytime you see nakedness, men, or immodesty, close your eyes for 30 seconds and recite a Bible verse. You're going you're gonna to be walking around with your eyes closed a lot. <laughs> I was driving down this morning and there was that fascinations billboard. I'm like, I'd be doing 85 with my eyes closed for 30 seconds right now <laughs> if I actually were true to this challenge. So take it or leave it. I think I'm just trying to make a point here with this one, right? right. Don't actually do this. You might get in a car wreck. You know? But what if you did? What if every time you turned on the TV or you scrolled through YouTube and you saw immodesty, you turned it off and said, well, that's it for the day. That, that's it. Once you see it, you're done for the day. You would not watch half as much as you, as you see. You know, that's the nice thing about, you know, the YouTube subscription is that you can cut out the ads and kind of, as long as you're subscribed to the right feeds and not the wrong ones, you know, you can kind of limit that. But even then, that stuff still creeps in. Well, here's a challenge to the women because, you know, I, I feel like I was kind of picking on them more than anybody. And this is a challenge I've heard uh, other women put to other women on this, uh, uh, this issue of, 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 of not wearing pants but wearing skirts. You know, it's easy to, for me to just get up and read the scriptures and rant and rave. But one of the most effective things that I've, I've heard uh, women do to kind of come around on this issue is to just, just to wear... Ex wear wear uh, modest clothing, clothing, excuse me, exclusively for 30 days. Just for 30 days, you know, go out, you know, and this is, you know, and if you're married, this is a great opportunity, you know, to go to your husband and say, hey, you know, I want to try this out. Go buy me some clothes, right? <laughs> I need to go to the mall and buy new clothes, right? I'm trying to get right with God. And, and, and husbands, by the way, if that's us, you know, we need to go ahead and give that money. That's an investment. That's a, that's a huge investment. You'll get, it's, it's worth every dime. To just wear that kind of clothing, you know, don't wear the pants for 30 days and see how you feel. <coughs> and I've, I've, I've heard of women that after they did that, they just, they, they just couldn't understand why they ever wore pants to begin with. And you know, and sometimes you'll see women out there that are, are, are they're wearing that kind of clothing and you just think that poor thing, she would, she would be so much comfortable right. and so much less self-conscious if she just understood God's principles of dress and it practiced them and be a happier person. 
right? And probably develop a, a little bit more self-worth than just being eye candy. Amen. I mean, is that all that women are, that's the, all the value you have in yourself today? Is just to be something for some stranger to look at and lust after in his heart? You know, you're better than that, you know? And really, that's the truth, though. You know, I say it jokingly, but it's true. And, uh, you know, so I just wanted to preach on that because, you know, that's the culture we're living in today. And, and we need to be reminded of these things that, you know, we're surrounded by nakedness. Let's not become desensitized to it. And if it's something that's in our lives, let's, let's get rid of it. And let's, let's understand biblical modesty and biblical uh, nakedness and what it is, what it is, and let's practice it. Let's go ahead and pray.